Harrigan snorted. Scientific basis, my foot. All right. I just wanted to know. You'll be saying next she's the woman with the box. What woman with the box? Oh, just one of the wild stories that turns up from time to time. By Nostradamus, out of Mother Shipton. Some people will swallow anything. You might at least tell me how you are getting on with that list of names. Uh, the boys have been hard at work, but these things take time and a lot of routine work. Names without addresses or Christian names aren't easy to trace or identify. Let's take it from a different angle. I'd be willing to bet you one thing. Within a fairly recent period, say a year to a year and a half, every one of those names has appeared on a death certificate. Am I right? He gave me a queer look. Uh, you're right. For what it's worth? That's the thing they all have in common. Death. Yes, but that mayn't mean as much as it sounds, Mark. Have you any idea how many people die every day in the British Isles? And some of those names are quite common, which doesn't help. Delafontaine, I said. Mary Delafontaine, that's not a very common name, is it? The funeral was last Tuesday, I understand. He shot me a quick glance. How do you know that? Saw it in the paper, I suppose. I heard it from a friend of hers. There was nothing fishy about her death, I can tell you that. In fact, there's been nothing questionable about any of the deaths the police have been investigating. If they were accidents, it might be suspicious, but the deaths are all perfectly normal deaths. Pneumonia, cerebral hemorrhage, tumour on the brain, gallstones, one case of polio, nothing in the least suspicious. I nodded. Not accident, I said. Not poisoning, just plain illnesses leading to death, just as Thurza Gray claims. Are you really suggesting that that woman can cause someone she's never seen, miles away, to catch pneumonia and die of it? I'm not suggesting such a thing. She did. I think it's fantastic, and I'd like to think it's impossible, but there are certain curious factors. There's the casual mention of a pale horse in connection with the removal of unwanted persons. There is a place called the Pale Horse, and the woman who lives there practically boasts that such an operation is possible. Living in that neighborhood is a man who is recognized very positively as the man who was seen following Father Gorman on the night that he was killed, the night when he had been called to a dying woman who was heard to speak of great wickedness. Rather a lot of coincidences, don't you think? The man couldn't have been venerable, since according to you he's been paralyzed for years. It isn't possible from the medical point of view that that paralysis could be faked? Of course not. The limbs would be atrophied. That certainly seems to settle the question, I admitted. I sighed. A pity. If there is a... I don't know quite what to call it, a... An organization that specializes in removals, human. Venables is the kind of brain I can see running it. The things he has in that house of his represent a fantastic amount of money. Where does that money come from? I paused and then said, All those people who have died, tidily, in their beds of this, that, and the other, were there people who profited by their deaths? Someone always profits by a death, in greater or lesser degree. There were no notably suspicious circumstances, if that's what you mean. It isn't quite. Lady Hesketh Dubois, as you probably know, left about fifty thousand net. A niece and a nephew inherit. Nephew lives in Canada. Niece is married and lives in north of England. Both could do with the money. Thomasina Tuckerton was left a very large fortune by her father. If she died unmarried before the age of twenty-one, it reverts to her stepmother. Stepmother seems quite a blameless creature. Then there's your Mrs. De La Fontaine. Money left to a cousin. Ah, yes. And the cousin? In Kenya, with her husband. All splendidly absent, I commented. Corrigan threw me an annoyed glance. Of the three Sanfords who've kicked the bucket, one left a wife much younger than himself who was married again rather quickly. Deceased Sanford was an R.C. and wouldn't have given her a divorce. A fellow called Sidney Harmonsworth, who died of cerebral hemorrhage, was suspected at the yard of augmenting his income by discreet blackmail. 
Several people in high places must be greatly relieved that he is no more. What you're saying in effect is that all these deaths were convenient deaths. What about Corrigan? Corrigan grinned. Corrigan is a common name. Quite a lot of Corrigans have died, but not to the particular advantage of anyone in particular, so far as we can learn. That settles it. You're the next prospective victim. Take good care of yourself. I will. And don't think that your Witch of Endor is going to strike me down with a duodenal ulcer or a Spanish flu, not a case-hardened doctor. Listen, Jim, I want to investigate this claim of Thurza Gray's. Will you help me? No, I won't. I can't understand a clever, educated fellow like you being taken in by such balderdash. I sighed. Can't you use another word? I'm tired of that one. Poppycock, if you like it better. I don't much. Obstinate fellow, aren't you, Mark? As I see it, I said, somebody has to be. Chapter 10 Glendara Close was very, very new. It swept round in an uneven semicircle, and at its lower end the builders were still at work. About halfway along its length was a gate, inscribed with the name of Everest. Visible, bent over the garden border, planting bulbs, was a rounded back, which Inspector Lejeune recognized without difficulty as that of Mr. Zachariah Osborne. He opened the gate and passed inside. Mr. Osborne rose from his stooping position and turned to see who had entered his domain. On recognizing his visitor, an additional flush of pleasure rose to his already flushed face. Mr. Osborne in the country was looking very much the same as Mr. Osborne in his shop in London. He wore stout country shoes and was in his shirt sleeves, but even this déshabille detracted little from the dapper neatness of his appearance. A fine dew of perspiration showed on the shining baldness of his domed head. This he carefully wiped with a pocket handkerchief before advancing to meet his visitor. "'Inspector Lejeune!' he exclaimed pleasurably. "'I take this as an honour. I do indeed, sir. I received your acknowledgment of my letter, but I never hoped to see you in person. Welcome to my little abode. Welcome to Everest. The name surprises you, perhaps. I have always been deeply interested in the Himalayas. I followed every detail of the Everest expedition. What a triumph for our country!' Sir Edmund Hillary, what a man, what endurance! As one who has never had to suffer any personal discomfort, I do appreciate the courage of those who go forth to scale unconquered mountains or sail through ice-bound seas to discover the secrets of the pole. But come inside and partake, I beg of you, of some simple refreshment. Leading the way, Mr. Osborne ushered Lejeune into the small bungalow which was the acme of neatness, though rather sparsely furnished. I'm not quite settled yet, explained Mr. Osborne. I attend local sales whenever possible. There is good stuff to be picked up that way, at a quarter of the cost one would have to pay in a shop. Now, what can I offer you? A glass of sherry? A beer? A cup of tea? I could have the kettle on in a jiffy. Lejeune expressed a preference for beer. Here we are, then, said Mr. Osborne, returning a moment later with two brimming pewter tankards. We will sit and take our rest. <laughs> Ever rest. <laughs> the name of my house has a double meaning. I'm always fond of a little joke. Those social amenities satisfied, Mr. Osborne leaned forward, hopefully. My information was of service to you? Lejeune softened the blow as much as possible. Not as much as we hoped, I'm afraid. Ah, I confess I am disappointed. Though, really, there is, I realise, no reason to suppose that a gentleman proceeding in the same direction as Father Gorman should necessarily be his murderer. That was really too much to hope for. And this Mr. Venables is well-to-do and much respected locally, I understand, moving in the best social circles. Uh, the point is, said Lejeune, that it could not have been Mr. Venables that you saw on that particular evening. Oh, but it was. I have absolutely no doubt in my own mind. I am never mistaken about a face. I am afraid you must have been this time, said Lejeune gently. You see, Mr. Venables is a victim of polio. 
For over three years he has been paralyzed from the waist down, and is unable to use his legs. Polio! ejaculated Mr. Osborne. Oh, dear, dear. That does seem to settle the matter. And yet, uh, you will excuse me, Inspector Lejeune, I hope you won't take offence, but that really is so? I mean, you have definite medical evidence as to that? Yes, Mr. Osborne, we have. Mr. Venables is a patient of Sir William Dugdale of Harley Street, a most eminent member of the medical profession. Of course, of course. FRCP. A very well-known name. Oh, dear. I seem to have fallen down badly. I was so very sure. And to trouble you for nothing. Oh, you mustn't take it like that, said Lejeune quickly. Your information is still very valuable. It is clear that the man you saw must bear a very close resemblance to Mr. Venables. And since Mr. Venables is a man of distinctly unusual appearance, that is extremely valuable knowledge to have. There cannot be many persons answering to that description. True, true, Mr. Osborne cheered up a little. A man of the criminal classes resembling Mr. Venables in appearance, there certainly cannot be many such in the files at Scotland Yard. He looked hopefully at the inspector. It may not be quite so simple as that, said Lejeune slowly. The man may not have a record. And in any case, as you said just now, there is as yet no reason to assume that this particular man had anything to do with the attack on Father Gorman. Mr. Osborne looked depressed again. <laughs> you must forgive me. Wishful thinking, I'm afraid, on my part. I should so like to have been able to give evidence at a murder trial. And they would not have been able to shake me, I assure you of that. Oh, no, I should have stuck to my guns. Lejeune was silent, considering his host thoughtfully. Mr. Osborne responded to the silent scrutiny. Yes? Mr. Osborne, why would you have stuck to your guns, as you put it? Mr. Osborne looked astonished. Because I am so certain. Oh. Oh, yes, uh, I see what you mean. The man was not the man. So I have no business to feel certain. And yet, I do. Lejeune leaned forward. You may have wondered why I have come to see you today. Having received medical evidence that the man seen by you could not have been Mr. Venables, why am I here? Quite, quite. Well then, Inspector Lejeune, why did you come? I came, said Lejeune, because the very positiveness of your identification impressed me. I wanted to know on what grounds your certainty was based. It was a foggy night, remember? I have been to your shop. I have stood where you stood, in your doorway, and looked across the street. On a foggy night, it seemed to me that a figure at that distance would be very insubstantial, that it would be almost impossible to distinguish features clearly. Up to a point, of course, you were right. Fog was setting in, but it came, if you understand me, in patches. It cleared for a short space every now and then. It did so at the moment that I saw Father Gorman walking fast along the opposite pavement. That is why I saw him and the man who followed shortly after him so clearly. Moreover, just when the second man was abreast of me, he flicked on a lighter to relight his cigarette. His profile at that moment was very clear, the nose, the chin, the pronounced Adam's apple. That's a striking-looking man, I thought. I've never seen him about before. If he'd ever been into my shop, I'd have remembered him, I thought. So, you see? Mr. Osborne broke off. Yes, I see, said Lejeune thoughtfully. A brother? suggested Mr. Osborne hopefully. A twin brother, perhaps? Now that would be a solution. The identical twin solution. Lejeune smiled and shook his head. So very convenient in fiction, but in real life, he shook his head, it doesn't happen, you know. It really doesn't happen. No, 
No, I suppose not. But possibly an ordinary brother? A close family resemblance? Mr. Osborne looked wistful. As far as we can ascertain, Lejeune spoke carefully, Mr. Venables has not got a brother. As far as you can ascertain, Mr. Osborne repeated the words. Though of British nationality, he was born abroad. His parents only brought him to England when he was eleven years old. You don't know very much about him, really, then? About his family, I mean. No, said Lejeune thoughtfully. It isn't easy to find out very much about Mr. Venables without, that is to say, going and asking him. And we've no grounds for doing that. He spoke deliberately. There were ways of finding things out without going and asking, but he had no intention of telling Mr. Osborne so. So, if it wasn't for the medical evidence, he said, getting to his feet, you'd be sure about the identification. Oh, yes said Mr. Osborne, following suit. It's quite a hobby of mine, you know, memorising faces. He chuckled. Many a customer I've surprised that way. How's the asthma? I'd say to someone. And she'd look quite surprised. You came in last March, I'd say. With a prescription, one of Dr. Hargreaves. And wouldn't she look surprised? Did me a lot of good in business. It pleases people to be remembered, though I wasn't as good with names as with faces. I started making a hobby of the thing, quite young. If royalty can do it, I used to say to myself, you can do it, Zachariah Osborne. After a while, it becomes automatic. You hardly have to make an effort. Lejeune sighed. I'd like to have a witness like you in the box, he said. Identification is always a tricky business. Most people can't tell you anything at all. They'll say things like, oh, tallish, I think. Fair-haired, well, not very fair, sort of middling. Ordinary sort of face, eyes blue, or grey, or perhaps brown. Grey Macintosh, or it may have been dark blue. Mr. Osborne laughed. Not much good to you, that sort of thing. Frankly, a witness like you would be a godsend. Mr. Osborne looked pleased. It's a gift, he said modestly. But mind you, I've cultivated my gift. You know the game they play at children's parties? A lot of objects brought in on a tray and a few minutes given to memorize them? I can score a hundred percent every time. Quite surprises people. How wonderful, they say. It's not wonderful. It's a knack. Comes with practice. He chuckled. I'm not a bad conjurer, either. I do a bit to amuse the kiddies at Christmas time. Excuse me, Mr. Lejeune. What? Have you got in your breast pocket? He leaned forward and extracted a small ashtray. Tut, tut, sir. And you in the police force? He laughed heartily, and Lejeune laughed with him. Then Mr. Osborne sighed. It's a nice little place I've got here, sir. The neighbours seem pleasant and friendly. It's the life I've been looking forward to for years. But I'll admit to you, Mr. Lejeune, that I miss the interest of my own business. Always someone coming in and out. Types, you know, lots of types to study. I've looked forward to having my little bit of garden, and I've got quite a lot of interests, butterflies, as I told you, and a bit of bird-watching now and again. I didn't realise that I'd miss what I might call the human element so much. I'd looked forward to going abroad in a small way. Well, I've taken one weekend trip to France, Quite nice, I must say, but I felt very strongly that England's really good enough for me. I didn't care for the foreign cooking, for one thing. They haven't the least idea, as far as I can see, how to do eggs and bacon. He sighed again. Just shows you what human nature is. Look forward no end to retiring, I did. And now, do you know, I've actually played with the idea of buying a small share in a pharmaceutical business here in Bournemouth, just enough to give me an interest. No need to be tied to the shop all the time, but I'd feel in the middle of things again. It will be the same with you, I expect. You'll make plans ahead, but when the time comes, you'll miss the excitement of your present life. Lejeune smiled. A policeman's life is not such a romantically exciting one as you think, Mr. Osborne. You've got the amateur's view of crime. Most of it is dull routine. 
We're not always chasing down criminals and following up mysterious clues. It can be quite a dull business, really. Mr. Osborne looked unconvinced. Oh, you know best, he said. Goodbye, Mr. Lejeune. And I'm sorry indeed that I haven't been able to help you. If there was anything, any time, I'll let you know, Lejeune promised him. That day at the fate, it seemed such a chance, Osborne murmured sadly. I know. A pity the medical evidence is so definite. But one can't get over that sort of thing, can one? Well... Mr. Osborne let the word linger, but Lejeune did not notice it. He strode away briskly. Mr. Osborne stood by the gate looking after him. Medical evidence, he said. Doctors, indeed. If he knew half what I know about doctors. <laughs> Innocents, that's what they are. Doctors, indeed. Chapter 11 Mark Easterbrook's Narrative First Hermia, now Corrigan. All right, then. I was making a fool of myself. I was accepting Balderdash as solid truth. I had been hypnotized by that phony woman Thurza Gray into accepting a farrago of nonsense. I was a credulous, superstitious ass. I decided to forget the whole damned business. What was it to do with me, anyway? Through the mist of disillusionment, I heard the echoes of Mrs. Dane Calthrop's urgent tones. You've got to do something. All very well to say things like that. You need someone to help you. I had needed Hermia. I had needed Corrigan. But neither of them would play. There was no one else. Unless... I sat, considering the idea... On an impulse, I went to the telephone and rang Mrs. Oliver. Hello? Mark Easterbrook here. Yes? Can you tell me the name of that girl who was staying in the house for the fate? I expect so. Uh, let me see. Mm, yes, of course. Ginger, that was her name. I know that. But her other name? What other name? I doubt if she was christened Ginger, and she must have a surname. Well, of course. But I've no idea what it is. One never seems to hear any surnames nowadays. It's the first time I'd ever met her. There was a slight pause, and then Mrs. Oliver said, You'll have to ring up Rhoda and ask her. I didn't like that idea. Somehow I felt shy about it. Oh, I can't do that, I said. It's perfectly simple, said Mrs. Oliver encouragingly. Just say you've lost her address, and can't remember her name, and you'd promise to send her one of your books, or the name of a shop that sells cheap caviar, or to return a handkerchief which she lent you when your nose bled one day, or the address of a rich friend who wants a picture restored. Any of those do? I can think of lots more, if you like. One of those will do beautifully, I assured her. I rang off, dialed one hundred, and presently was speaking to Rhoda. Ginger, said Rhoda. Oh, she lives in a mews. Calgary Place. Forty-five. Wait a minute. I'll give you her telephone number. She went away and returned a minute later. It's Capricorn 35987. Got it? Yes. Thanks, but I haven't got her name. I never heard it. Her name? Oh, her surname, you mean. Corrigan. Catherine Corrigan. What did you say? A nothing. Thanks, Rhoda. It seemed to me an odd coincidence. Corrigan. Two Corrigans. Perhaps it was an omen. I dialed Capricorn 35987. Ginger sat opposite me at a table in the white cockatoo, where we had met for a drink. She looked refreshingly the same as she had looked at much deeping. A tousled mop of red hair, an engaging freckled face, and alert green eyes. She was wearing her London artistic livery of skin-tight pants, a sloppy Joe jersey, and black woolen stockings, but otherwise she was the same ginger. I liked her very much. "'I've had to do a lot of work to track you down,' I said. "'Your surname and your address and your telephone number, all unknown. I've got a problem.' "'That's what my daily always says. It usually means that I have to buy her a new saucepan scourer 
or a carpet brush or something dull. You don't have to buy anything, I assured her. Then I told her. It didn't take quite as long as the story I had told to Hermia, because she was already familiar with the pale horse and its occupants. I averted my eyes from her. As I finished the tale, I didn't want to see her reaction. I didn't want to see the indulgent amusement or stark incredulity. The whole thing sounded more idiotic than ever. No one, except Mrs. Dane Calthrop, could possibly feel about it as I felt. I drew patterns on the plastic tabletop with a stray fork. Ginger's voice came briskly. That's all, is it? That's all, I admitted. What are you going to do about it? You think I should do something about it? Well, of course. Someone's got to do something. You can't have an organization going about bumping people off and not do anything. But what can I do? I could have fallen on her neck and hugged her. She was sipping perno and frowning. Warmth spread over me. I was no longer alone. Presently, she said musingly, You'll have to find out what it all means. I agree. But how? Well, there seem to be one or two leads. Perhaps I can help. Would you? But there's your job. Plenty could be done out of office hours. She frowned again as she thought. That girl, she said at last, the one at supper after the old Vic, Poppy or something, she knows about it. She must do to say what she did. Yes, but she got frightened and sheared off when I tried to ask her questions. She was scared. She definitely wouldn't talk. Well, that's where I can help, said Ginger confidently. She'll tell me things she wouldn't tell you. Can you arrange for us to meet? Your friend and her and you and me? A show or a dinner or something? Then she looked doubtful. Or is that too expensive? I assured her that I could support the expense. As for you, Ginger thought a minute, I believe, she said slowly, that your best bet would be the Thomasina Tuckerton angle. But how? She's dead. And somebody wanted her dead, if your ideas are correct, and arranged it with the pale horse. There seemed two possibilities. The stepmother, or else the girl she had the fight with at Luigi's and whose young man she had pinched. She was going to marry him, perhaps. That wouldn't suit the stepmother's book. Or the girl's, if she was crazy enough about the young man. Either of them might have gone to the pale horse. We might get a lead there. What was the girl's name? Or don't you know? I think it was Lou. Ash blonde lank hair, medium height, rather bosomy. I agreed with the description. I think I've met her about. Lou Ellis. She's got a bit of money herself. She didn't look like it. Or well, they don't. But she has, all right. Anyway, she could afford to pay the pale horse's fees. They don't do it for nothing, I suppose. One would hardly imagine so. You'll have to tackle the stepmother. It's more up your street than mine. Go and see her. I don't know where she lives or anything. Luigi knows something about Tommy's home. He'll know what county she lives in, I should imagine. A few books of reference ought to do the rest. But what idiots we are! You saw the notice in the Times of her death. You've only got to go and look in their files. I'll have to have a pretext for tackling the stepmother, I said thoughtfully. Ginger said that would be easy. You're someone, you see, she pointed out, a historian. And you lecture, and you've got letters after your name. Mrs. Tuckerton will be impressed and probably tickled to death to see you. And the pretext? Some feature of interest about her house? Suggested Ginger, vaguely. Sure to have something if it's an old one. Nothing to do with my period, I objected. Well, she won't know that, said Ginger. People always think that anything over a hundred years old must interest a historian or a, an archaeologist. Or how about a picture? There must be some old pictures of some kind. Anyway, you make an appointment, and you arrive, and you butter her up and be charming, and then you say you once met her daughter, her stepdaughter, and say how sad, etc., etc., and then bring in quite suddenly a reference to the pale horse. Be a little sinister, if you like. And then? And then you observe the reaction. If you mention the pale horse out of the blue and she has a guilty conscience, I defy anyone not to show some sign. And if she does, what next? Well, the important thing is that we'll know we're on the right track. Once we're sure, we can go full steam ahead. She nodded thoughtfully. There's something else. Why do you think the grey woman told you all she did tell you? Why was she so forthcoming? 
The common sense answer is because she's potty. No, I don't mean that. I mean, why you? You in particular. I just wondered if there might be some kind of tie-up. Tie-up with what? Wait, just a minute while I get my ideas in order. I waited. Ginger nodded twice emphatically, then spoke. Supposing, just supposing it went like this. The poppy girl knows all about the pale horse, in a vague kind of way, not through personal knowledge, but by hearing it talked about. She sounds the sort of girl that wouldn't be noticed much by anyone when they were talking, but she'd quite likely take in a lot more than they thought she did. Rather silly people are often like that. Say she was overheard talking to you about it that night, and someone ticks her off. Next day, you come and ask her questions, and she's been scared so she won't talk. But the fact that you've come and asked her also gets around. Now, what would be the reason for your asking questions? You're not the police. The likely reason would be that you're a possible client. But surely it's logical, I tell you. You've heard rumours of this thing. You want to find out about it, for your own purposes. Presently, you appear at the fate in much deeping. You are brought to the pale horse, presumably because you've asked to be taken there. And what happens? Thurza Gray goes straight into her sales talk. I suppose it's a possibility. I considered. Do you think she can do what she claims to do, Ginger? Personally, I'd be inclined to say, of course, she can't, but all things can happen. Especially with things like hypnotism. Telling someone to go and take a bite out of a candle the next afternoon at four o'clock, and they do it, without having any idea why. That sort of thing. And electric boxes where you put in a drop of blood, and it tells you if you're going to have cancer in two years' time. It all sounds rather bogus, but perhaps not entirely bogus. About Thurza, I don't think it's true, but I'm terribly afraid it might be. Yes, I said somberly. That explains it very well. I might put in a bit of work on Lou, said Ginger thoughtfully. I know lots of places where I can run across her. Luigi might know a few things, too. But the first thing, she added, is to get in touch with Poppy. The latter was arranged fairly easily. David was free three nights ahead. We settled on a musical show, and he arrived with Poppy in tow. We went to the Fantasy for supper, and I noticed that Ginger and Poppy, after a prolonged retirement to powder their noses, reappeared on excellent terms with each other. No controversial subjects were raised during the party on Ginger's instructions. We finally parted, and I drove Ginger home. Not much to report, she said cheerfully. I've been on to Lou. The man they quarrelled about was Jean Playden, by the way. A nasty bit of goods, if you ask me. Pretty much on the make. The girls all adore him. He was making quite a play for Lou, and then Tommy came along. Lou says he didn't care for her a bit. He was after her money. But she'd probably want to think that. Anyway, he dropped Lou like hot coal, and she was naturally sore about it. According to her, it wasn't much of a row, just a few girlish high spirits. <laughs> girlish high spirits? She tugged Tommy's hair out by the roots. I'm just telling you what Lou told me. She seems to have been very forthcoming. Oh, they all like talking about their affairs. They'll talk to anyone who will listen. Anyway... Lou has got another boyfriend now, another dud, I'd say, but she's already crazy about him. So it doesn't look to me as though she'd been a client of the pale horse. I brought the term up, but it didn't register. I think we can wash her out. Luigi doesn't think there was much in it either. On the other hand, he thinks Tommy was serious about Jean, and Jean was going for her in a big way. What have you done about the stepmother? As she was abroad, she comes back tomorrow. I've written her a letter, or rather, I got my secretary to write it, asking for an appointment. Good. We're getting things moving. I hope everything doesn't peter out. If it gets us anywhere. Well, something will, said Ginger enthusiastically. That reminds me. To go back to the beginning of all this, the theory is that Father Gorman was killed after being called out to a dying woman, and that he was murdered because of something she told him or confessed to him. What happened to that woman? Did she die? And who was she? There ought to be some lead there. She died. I don't really know much about her. I think her name was Davis. Well, couldn't you find out more? I'll see what I can do. If we could get at her background, we might find out how she knew what she did know. I see your point. 
I got Jim Corrigan on the telephone early the next morning and put my query to him. Uh, let me see now. We did get a bit further, but not much. Davis wasn't her real name. That's why it took a little time to check up on her. Now, half a moment. I jotted down a few things. Oh, yes. Here we are. Her real name was Archer, and her husband had been a small-time crook. She left him and went back to her maiden name. What sort of crook was Archer? And where is he now? Oh, very small stuff. Pinched things from department stores. Unconsidered trifles here and there. He had a few convictions. As to where he is now, he's dead. Not much there. No, there isn't. The firm Mrs. Davis was working for at the time of her death, the CRC, Customers' Reactions Classified, apparently didn't know anything about her, or her background. I thanked him and rang off. Chapter 12 Mark Easterbrook's Narrative Three days later, Ginger rang me up. I've got something for you, she said. A name and address. Write it down. I took out my notebook. Go ahead. Bradley is the name, and the address is 78 Municipal Square Buildings, Birmingham. Well, I'm damned. What is all this? Goodness knows, I don't. I doubt if Poppy does, really. Poppy? Is this? Yes. I've been working on Poppy in a big way. I told you I could get something out of her if I tried. Once I got her softened up, it was easy. How did you set about it? I asked curiously. Ginger laughed. Girls together stuff, you wouldn't understand. The point is that if a girl tells things to another girl, it doesn't really count. She doesn't think it matters. All in the trade union, so to speak. You could put it like that. Anyway, we lunched together, and I yapped a bit about my love life, and various obstacles, married man with impossible wife, Catholic wouldn't divorce him, made his life hell, and how she was an invalid, always in pain, but not likely to die for years, really much better for her if she could die. Said I had a good mind to try the pale horse, but I didn't really know how to set about it, and would it be extremely expensive? And Poppy said, yes, she thought it would. She'd heard they charged the earth, and I said, well, I have expectations, which I have, you know. A great uncle, a poppet, and I'd hate him to die, but the fact came in useful. Perhaps, I said, they'd take something on account. But how did one set about it? Then Poppy came across with that name and address. You had to go to him first, she said, to settle the business side. It's fantastic, I said. It is rather. We were both silent for a moment. I said incredulously, She told you quite openly... She didn't seem... scared, Ginger said impatiently. You don't understand. Telling me didn't count. And after all, Mark, if what we think is true, the business has to be more or less advertised, hasn't it? I mean, they must want new clients all the time. We're mad to believe anything of the kind. All right, we're mad. Are you going to Birmingham to see Mr. Bradley? Yes, I said. I'm going to see Mr. Bradley. If he exists. I hardly believed that he did. But I was wrong. Mr. Bradley did exist. Municipal Square Buildings was an enormous honeycomb of offices. 78 was on the third floor. On the ground glass door was neatly printed in black, C. R. Bradley, Commission Agent. And below, in smaller letters, Please Enter. I entered. There was a small outer office, empty, and a door marked private, half ajar. A voice from behind it said, Come in, please. The inner office was larger. It had a desk, one or two comfortable chairs, a telephone, a stack of box files, and Mr. Bradley sitting behind the desk. He was a small, dark man, with shrewd, dark eyes. He wore a dark business suit, and looked the acme of respectability. Uh, "'Just shut the door, will you?' he said pleasantly. "'And sit down. Uh, that chair's quite comfortable. Cigarette? No? Well, now, what can I do for you?' I looked at him. I didn't know how to begin. I hadn't the least idea what to say. It was, I think, sheer desperation that led me to attack with the phrase I did. Or it may have been the small, beady eyes. "'How much?' 
I said. It startled him a little, I was glad to note, but not in the way he ought to have been startled. He did not assume, as I would have assumed in his place, that someone not quite right in the head had come into his office. His eyebrows rose. Well, 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 he said. You don't waste much time, do you? I held to my line. What's the answer? He shook his head gently in a slightly reproving manner. Uh, that's not the way to go about things. We must proceed in the proper manner. I shrugged my shoulders. As you like. What's the proper manner? We haven't introduced ourselves yet, have we? I don't know your name. At the moment, I said, I don't really think I feel inclined to tell it to you. Cautious. Cautious. An admirable quality, though not always practicable. Now, who sent you to me? Who is our mutual friend? Again, I can't tell you. A friend of mine has a friend who knows a friend of yours. Mr. Bradley nodded his head. And that's the way a lot of my clients come, he said. Some of the problems are rather delicate. You know my profession, I presume? He had no intention of waiting for my reply. He hastened to give me the answer. Turf Commission Agent, he said. You're interested, perhaps, in uh, horses? There was just the faintest pause before the last word. I'm not a racing man, I said noncommittally. There are many aspects of the horse. Racing, hunting, hacking. It's the sporting aspect that interests me. Betting. He paused for a moment, and then asked casually, almost too casually, Any particular horse you had in mind? I shrugged my shoulders and burnt my boats. A pale horse. Ah, very good, excellent. You yourself, if I may say so, seem to be rather a dark horse. <laughs> you mustn't be nervous. There is really no need to be nervous. That's what you say, I said rather rudely. Mr. Bradley's manner became more bland and soothing. I can quite understand your feelings, but I can assure you that you needn't have any anxiety. I'm a lawyer myself. Disbarred, of course, he added parenthetically, in what was really almost an engaging way. Otherwise I shouldn't be here. But I can assure you that I know my law. Everything I recommend is perfectly legal and above board. It's just a question of a bet. A man can bet on anything he pleases, whether it will rain tomorrow, whether the Russians can send a man to the moon, or whether your wife's going to have twins. You can bet whether Mrs. B will die before Christmas, or whether Mrs. C will live to be a hundred. You back your judgment, or your intuition, or whatever you like to call it. It's as simple as that. I felt exactly as though I were being reassured by a surgeon before an operation. Mr. Bradley's consulting room manner was perfect. I said slowly, I don't really understand this business of the pale horse. And that worries you? Yes, it worries a lot of people. More things in heaven and earth, Horatio, and so on, and so on. Frankly, I don't understand it myself, but it gets results. It gets results in the most marvellous way. If you could tell me more about it. I had settled on my role now, cautious, eager, but scared. It was obviously an attitude with which Mr. Bradley had frequently had to cope. Do you know the place at all? I made a quick decision. It would be unwise to lie. I, uh, well... Yes, I was with some friends. They took me there. Charming old pub, full of historical interest, and they've done wonders in restoring it. You met her, then? My friend Miss Gray, I mean. Yes, yes, of course. An extraordinary woman. Isn't she? Yes, isn't she? You hit it exactly. An extraordinary woman. And with extraordinary powers. The things she claims, surely, quite... Well, impossible. Exactly. That's the whole point. The things she claims to be able to know and do are impossible. Everybody would say so. In a court of law, for instance. 
The black, beady eyes were boring into mine. Mr. Bradley repeated the words with designed emphasis. In a court of law, for instance, the whole thing would be ridiculed. If that woman stood up and confessed to murder, murder by remote control or willpower or whatever nonsensical name she likes to use, that confession couldn't be acted upon, even if her statement was true. Which, of course, sensible men like you and I don't believe for one moment. It couldn't be admitted legally. Murder by remote control isn't murder in the eyes of the law. It's just nonsense. That's the whole beauty of the thing. As you'll appreciate, if you think for a moment. I understood that I was being reassured. Murder committed by occult powers was not murder in an English court of law. If I were to hire a gangster to commit murder with a kosh or a knife, I was committed with him, an accomplice before the fact. I had conspired with him. But if I commissioned Thurza Gray to use her black arts, those black arts were not admissible. That was what, according to Mr. Bradley, was the beauty of the thing. All my natural skepticism rose up in protest. I burst out heatedly. But, damn it all, it's fantastic! I shouted. I don't believe it. It's impossible. I agree with you. I really do. Thurza Gray is an extraordinary woman, and she certainly has some extraordinary powers, but one can't believe all the things she claims for herself. As you say, it's too fantastic. In this age, one really can't credit that someone can send out thought waves, or whatever it is, either oneself or through a medium sitting in a cottage in England and cause someone to sicken and die of a convenient disease out in Capri or somewhere like that. But that is what she claims. Oh, yes. Oh, of course she has powers. She is Scottish, and what is called second sight is a peculiarity of that race. It really does exist. What I do believe, and believe without a doubt, is this. He leaned forward, wagging a forefinger impressively. Thurza Gray does know beforehand when someone is going to die. It's a gift. And she has it. He leaned back, studying me. I waited. Let's assume a hypothetical case. Someone, yourself or another, would like very much to know when. Let's say Great Aunt Eliza is going to die. It's useful, you must admit, to know something like that. Nothing unkind in it, nothing wrong, just a matter of business convenience. What plans to make? Will there be, shall we say, a useful sum of money coming in by next November? If you knew that, definitely, you might take up some valuable option. Death is such a chancy matter. Dear old Eliza might live, pepped up by doctors for another ten years. You'd be delighted, of course, you're fond of the dear old girl, but how useful it would be to know. He paused and then leaned a little further forward. Now that's where I come in. I'm a betting man. I'll bet on anything. Naturally, on my own terms. You come to see me. Naturally, you wouldn't want to bet on the old girl's passing out. That would be repulsive to your finer feelings. So we put it this way. You bet me a certain sum that Aunt Eliza will be hale and hearty still next Christmas. I bet you that she won't. The beady eyes were on me, watching. Nothing against that, is there? Simple. We have an argument on the subject. I say Aunt E is lined up for death. You say she isn't. We draw up a contract and sign it. I give you a date. I say that a fortnight either way from that date, Aunt E's funeral service will be read. You say it won't. If you're right, I pay you. If you're wrong, you pay me. I looked at him. I tried to sum up the feelings of a man who wants a rich old lady out of the way. I shifted it to a blackmailer. Easier to throw oneself into that part. Some man had been bleeding me for years. I couldn't bear it any longer. I wanted him dead. I hadn't the nerve to kill him myself, but I'd give anything, yes, anything. I spoke. My voice was hoarse. I was acting the part with some confidence. What terms? Mr. Bradley's manner underwent a rapid change. It was gay, almost facetious. Oh, that's where we came in, isn't it? Or rather, where you came in. 
How much, you said. Really, quite startled me. Never heard anyone come to the point so soon. What terms? Well, that depends. It depends on several different factors. Roughly, it depends on the amount that is at stake. In some cases, it depends on the funds available to the client. An inconvenient husband, or a blackmailer, or something of that kind, would depend on how much my client could afford to pay. I don't, let me make that clear, bet with poor clients, except in the kind of case I've just been outlining. In that case, it would depend on the amount of Aunt Eliza's estate. Terms are by mutual agreement. We both want something out of it, don't we? The odds, however, work out usually at five hundred to one. Five hundred to one? That's pretty steep. My wager is pretty steep. If Aunt Eliza were pretty well booked for the tomb, you'd know it already, and you wouldn't come to me. To prophesy somebody's death to within two weeks means pretty long odds. Five thousand pounds to one hundred isn't at all out of the way. Supposing you lose? Mr. Bradley shrugged his shoulders. Oh, that's just too bad. I pay up. And if I lose? I pay up. Supposing I don't? Mr. Bradley leaned back in his chair. He half closed his eyes. I shouldn't advise that, he said softly. I really shouldn't. Despite the soft tone, I felt a faint shiver pass over me. He had uttered no direct menace, but the menace was there. I got up. I said, I... I must think it over. Mr. Bradley was once more his pleasant and urbane self. Certainly, think it over. Never rush into anything. If you decide to do business, come back, and we will go into the matter fully. Take your time. No hurry in the world. Take your time. I went out with those words echoing in my ears. Take your time. Your time. Your time. Your time. Your time. Your time.